Welcome to the Sizer online tutorial. In this first video of the concept mode series, we will explain the main sections and features of concept mode. We call concept mode a preliminary gravity load design tool. It is possible to create gravity load models of structures up to six stories in height to design columns, stud, walls, beams, joists, and now CLT panels. You can input line, area, and point loads and Sizer will automatically distribute the loads based on the tributary area and transfer the loads from the top to the bottom story. The tool will give you a preliminary size for your members, create material lists for costing purposes, and report reactions at the base of the members. We refer to concept mode as a preliminary design tool because of some of its design assumptions and limits such as columns and walls are pinned at both ends, combined load cannot be applied, and there is no bearing design, among other restrictions. That being said, it is necessary to refine the design of members directly in beam or column mode. Concept mode cannot distinguish what is a supporting member, so it is necessary to do this manually in column and beam mode to ensure that the connection details and load path are correct. When it comes to pattern loading, if you have a multi-span beam, the code requires that pattern load cases for live loads need to be checked, so the design of the member may end up being different in beam mode after further analysis of the member is completed. The way concept mode works is that you make your way across the taskbar at the top, adding grid lines, then specifying columns and walls. Once some walls and columns are specified, options for beams and floors will become available so that you can draw them into your project file. Like most programs, when you're dealing with measurements, it is best to specify the unit system you want to use before starting anything. The default for the Canadian version is metric, but you can navigate to the settings format tab and switch to imperial units if you desire. You need to press OK for the change to take effect. Another very important step is establishing your snap increment. By default, the snap increment is set to one foot or 30 centimeters but you can change this to whatever you want, depending on the spacing of the members in your project file and the level of detail you require. This can be modified in the View tab. If you decide to automatically generate a grid, which we will discuss next, the grid system will be based on the snap increment specified in this tab. In order to ease the comprehension of this feature in this example, we will specify a snap increment of 100 cm for both north to south and east to west directions. The settings window is also the place where you have the ability to modify specific design assumptions. You might have noticed that these design settings are exactly the same information input available in the beam mode and column mode. In the next tab, you will find the default values concerning deflection limits, minimum bearing length, and column load eccentricity. Some toggles only apply to beam or column mode. So. Before you can start drawing the various members in your project file, it is necessary to establish grid lines. There are two options for doing this. The first option is to specify grid lines manually. When in the grid line view, if you click on the blank screen, you will establish a grid point based on the snap increment previously specified. As you can see, when clicking on a specific point, it will generate a grid line on the closest 100 cm snap increment value defined. If you are not happy with where you placed it, you can modify the grid line's position independently of the snap increment by toggling a grid line and changing its location up at the top right of the window. You can also change the grid line name if you want as well. Alternatively, you can choose to automatically generate a grid system based on your snap increment. This is done by clicking the edit icon, then generate grid button. Similarly, the hotkeys to quickly generate the grid with this keyboard is Ctrl Shift G. It is possible to delete a specific grid line by selecting it and pressing the delete button. You can select multiple grid lines by holding the Ctrl key. After establishing the grid lines of our project file, we can add up to six stories in the level section under the design tab or by clicking the floor and roof levels icon, which will make the window shown here to display. If you change the elevation, specify the height of the new story and click Add, a new story will automatically be added. 
The level with the highest elevation will automatically be assigned as the roof. When it comes to making a project file, if the structure has a lot of the same details on each story, you can create all the details for that specific story, then go into the window, and before modifying the elevation to add a story, toggle the option to Copy Selected Level when adding, and the members specified in the story will automatically be copied up to this new story. This will help save time while creating a project file. Now that all the preliminary information has been entered, we can design columns, walls, beams and joists on each floor inside concept mode. When inserting new columns, it is only possible to locate them on the intersection of the grid lines. To assign a column at a specific location outside of the snap increment scope, you would have to modify the grid line manually as mentioned earlier. For every member type, if you click the form view icon, a window will appear where you can make multiple design groups with different details. This is useful for say specifying different types of beams or columns members in the same story or specifying different members on each story. In order to assign the newly created details to multiple columns, you would have to select them by pressing the control key and choose the group in the toolbar. If you leave unknowns for the group and specify the member in multiple places, Concept mode will base the design of that member on the member with the worst case loading. To insert walls into the design, you will have to go to the Walls View tab. Designing walls in concept mode is easy, since all you have to do is click the left mouse button on an intersection of a grid line, and while holding on the left mouse button, drag the mouse to another grid point and release. You can design it in pretty much any direction, just as long as it doesn't overlap with an existing wall or beam. The wall design group table is similar to the one we have just talked about in the column section, with information proper to walls and the possibility to design with either wall studs or wall CLT panels as the group type. Similar to how a wall was drawn, when inserting beams, you have to click and drag the left mouse from one column to the other, with the possibility of having cantilevers. Note that you cannot use walls to support a beam, you would have to define a column within a wall. When going to the Materials Design Group tab, while inside the beam view, you will notice a load transfer number input. Concept mode will allow you to transfer loads between beam members using what is known as a load transfer number. So for instance, if I want a beam to frame into members B1 and B2, I need to make sure that the new beam has a higher load transfer number. If this is not the case, a warning will appear stating that you cannot use a beam with identical load transfer number as support. So in this example, I have left the load transfer number of the members B1 and B2 as the default 0. Then, so that beam B3 can frame into members B1 and B2, I have made a separate beam design group and specified the load transfer number of 1, which is higher than the other members. The number could be 2, 3, or whatever, as long as it is higher than the members it is framing into. When clicking the Joist View tab, you can start designing joists on the model. In order to do that, you will have to specify four points on the grid where there are intersections with some restrictions. In fact, the created joist area must have at least two parallel sides and must be fully spanned by at least two supports in any direction, which means that the first and last joists must rest on the same supporting members. Failing to do so will generate the following warning message, Stating one of the restrictions that I have just mentioned. If you right click whilst in the process of creating a floor joist, it will cancel it so you can reassign the four points of the joist. It is important to mention that the joists will automatically span in the shortest direction unless they are unsupported in one direction. To change that direction, you will have to highlight the joist in question and change its direction from the pull down menu in the toolbar. The joist design group window is the same for roof and floor joists, with the exception of the default deflection limit values. In fact, for roof joists, the deflection limit is less stringent with a live load limit of L divided by 240 and a total limit of L divided by 180, compared to L divided by 360 and L divided by 180 respectively for floor joists. This difference is explained in video 5, Understanding Load Input. Also. For common dimensional lumber joists, the floor joist vibration criteria will come available 
although this criteria is not applied to roof joists. Once the structure is adequately designed, the next step is to add loads. By pressing the Load View tab, information regarding the level, type, distribution and magnitudes can be entered. The importance category of the structure and the sustained life section can also be adjusted. When selecting area as the distribution type, you have to select four points where you want the load area to be included. Note that if you apply a blanket load over the entire floor plan, any spot where there is no floor area will not affect the load input and the software will recognize only the loads where there is a joist area. Also, when applying loads, it is important to be careful that you do not apply partial area loads over a joist area. Doing so will generate a warning when running the design stating that the following loads were not applied to joist. To examine the critical member for a particular group in the concept mode design results, go back to the plan view and select the member by clicking on it. Now change to beam mode or column mode by pressing the mode button on the toolbar or by selecting the appropriate mode in the bone menu. Sizer first determines the reactions to the other members to be transferred to the selected one and converts the reactions to the appropriate types of loads. Sizer then transfers these loads and all of the design group information to beam or column mode, where you can perform a detailed design or code check on the member. Upon transferring a joist area to beam mode, Sizer converts the joist area into a representative joist to be analyzed as a beam. If it is a four-sided area, Sizer first asks you which of the edge joists you wish to transfer, as they may be of different lengths, have supports in different positions, or point loads from walls bearing at different points. One or the other of the edge joists will be the critical one for the joist area, so it is wise to examine both if they differ. We will now put into practice the features we have gone through in this tutorial and other features in the next video where we will do a demonstration of a detailed example in concept mode.